Oh, hi, I'm the- Oh, god damn it. Uh, okay, let's dispute that and- Okay, you know what? Screw this. Let's just watch someone else's video and- You know what? I'm feeling nostalgic. Let's go download a classic game ROM and- Of course they did. Well, the Super Bowl is on, so let's cook some corn and- Are you serious? You know what? Let's do something completely unique, creative, that nobody could possibly copyright by making my own, totally original content. First, I need to draw a rounded rectangle and... But guys, copyright law promotes creativity. <laughs> Oh my god, I can't say it with a straight face. Copyright is a legal construct that argues that the creators of an idea are the rightful owners of their idea and have a legitimate claim to how their idea may be conveyed or used. The principle is known as intellectual property. The author of a book and or the publisher may consent to allow fans to write their own fan fiction, for instance, but they do not want fans to make their money from doing so. As such the state will prosecute the copyright violator on behalf of the holder. It is argued that this is no different on principle than the state prosecuting a vandal or a murderer on behalf of the victim. But do these arguments have any merit? While the state is not justified in doing, well, anything, if there is a legitimate, logical, and consistent argument that justifies intellectual property, then there's no reason that it can't exist in a voluntary society. But in order to figure this out, we need to start at the beginning and figure out what property rights are. Even if the infinite universe theory is valid, there is only a finite amount of resources our society and individuals within can have access to at any one time. More importantly, people can't be expected to unanimously agree on where these scarce resources ought to go. One way of resolving this conflict is property rights. With it, the division of scarce resources becomes a simple question of objectively demonstrating legitimate ownership, rather than a contest of physical force or through wasting time in deliberation where one or more parties may not even want to negotiate, which is usually how physical force comes about in the first place. Now let's take a moment to talk about why property rights, aside from the purely pragmatic argument that it's preferable to liberation and violence, property is derived from self-ownership. You can only act because you have dominion over your own thoughts and body. You may act on the behalf of others, but only because you chose to do so. Every action you can possibly take is a demonstration of self-ownership, including attempting to argue against self-ownership. After all, to convey your thoughts to me against self-ownership, you have to write it down on paper with your hand, type it on a keyboard with your fingers, or vibrate your vocal cords to verbally communicate it. To form the thoughts in the first place requires dominion over your own thoughts. Parts in your body that you must have dominion over to be able to accomplish. After all, no third party is controlling you as a meat puppet, and even if they were, well, wouldn't they be exercising their self-ownership through their use of their thoughts and their actions in controlling you? Arguments against self-ownership are self-defeating and therefore invalid. Logically, if you own yourself, then you own the product of your actions. If you pick an apple from an unowned apple tree, you own the apple. If you fence in a plot of unclaimed land, you now own that land. From this, we can logically deduce the existence and legitimacy of property rights. With property rights, we can objectively demonstrate which units of scarce resources individuals can claim dominion over. This dominion entitles the owner to exclude others from using it without their consent. To own a car is to prevent others from using that car without the owner's permission. Property ownership is demonstrated by whoever either applies their labor to unknown goods or has traded for it. People are able to do this through their own labor, of which they have sole dominion over through self-ownership. Now, economics is the science of distributing scarce resources. Who should get cars? 
how many cars ought there to be? In the absence of scarcity, there's no point. The equilibrium of supply and demand is at infinite supply and zero price. Questions of marginal utility or aggregate demand become pointless, and any attempt to establish dominion is an inconsequential act of vanity. After all, how does your neighbor's ownership of a car limit your access to cars if you live in a post-scarcity society and you have access to a literally infinite number of cars? Put simply, property rights are exclusive control over a scarce resource. Now, are ideas scarce? Goods and services with scarcity often have material conditions that limit their production. Limited production capacity, insufficient inputs, shortages, you get the idea. So what would cause something intangible to material reality to be scarce? What shortage of material inputs limits their production or their replication? Ideas are not scarce. There may be a finite number of people who hold an idea, but as the idea can be endlessly copied for free, they cannot be legitimately claimed to be finite. Similarly, ideas cannot be stolen. Someone else's possession of an idea does not deprive the idea's prior holder, nor the original creator. You, knowing what space marines are and how they fit into the Warhammer 40k universe, does not mean Games Workshop the owners of that IP of the idea. Any claim to theft of an idea is both misleading since the act of theft deprives the rightful owner of their property and irrational since nothing can be objectively demonstrated to have been stolen. Ideas are intangible and cannot be interacted with through physical force. They can be recorded on physical mediums such as paper or on computer documents, books, music, baking recipes, video games, all excellent examples. The medium upon which ideas can be conveyed can be stolen. To steal a book, for example, is to deprive the book's previous owner of said book. The medium upon which an idea is conveyed is not the idea itself. When people pay for the book, they don't buy the idea or a license for the idea. They buy the physical medium so that the idea can be conveyed to them, usually in an entertaining or enlightening way. By stealing the book, you aren't stealing the idea that was conveyed by the book. You're stealing the book. The author still holds the idea for the book, as does anyone who has ever read the book. The act of idea theft, therefore, cannot be demonstrated to exist. In order for the owner of the intellectual property to protect what's theirs, they must necessarily have a claim to all medium used to produce an idea. If I created a song, I must have a property claim on all records, CDs, cassette players, TVs, computers, speakers, literally anything that could produce the song I have dominion over to prevent any copying of my work. Even if you are the rightful owner of the items you're copying my work onto. In this sense, intellectual property is not merely limited to the ideas in people's minds, since most matter in the universe could be put to copying these ideas. Intellectual property, therefore, creates a double standard in allowable forms of property. Either people have exclusive dominion over the resources and goods they control, or a third party can come in and stop them from using those resources to produce things that resemble ideas. We either have dominion over goods or ideas. Both cannot be true. Our resource ownership is derived from our self-ownership as explained earlier. Necessarily, a claim to how we can use our property is a claim that by simply owning an idea, one claims ownership over another person's labor, they claim ownership over that person. And if someone claims ownership over another person, even in part, that makes them their slave. Which creates an arbitrary standard in terms of who gets to enslave who. Because it's inconsistent, it is therefore invalid. The effect of intellectual property is totalitarianism. The reconciliation of this double standard of property rights requiring a coercive monopoly. Legitimate ownership over resources can be objectively demonstrated. 
The same cannot be said for intellectual property for reasons I stated previously. So applying property rights to ideas is an act of vanity. Ideas cannot be stolen because the original owner is deprived of nothing and continues to hold their idea. There is no rational or logical basis for intellectual property whatsoever. Intellectual property, therefore, is a purely statist construct, one that exists for the sole purpose of giving the priesthood of statism the ability to bestow the blessings of the state upon their most devoted followers. But these are all abstract arguments. How does this apply to the real world? The earliest instance of intellectual property was in Sybaris, in 500 BC, where the state issued one-year patents. There isn't much to go on here. But following that was the appropriately titled Statute of Monopolies, passed into British law in 1623 during the mercantilist guild system, in which guilds operated monopolies in every aspect of production in their given industry. The official narrative is that the law was intended to allow inventors to keep ownership over their inventions rather than fork it over to a guild. The actual effect of the law was to shift the monopolies from one group to another. Rather than the king deciding who got monopolies, it was parliament. In essence, the first historical act of patent protection was little more than the political power play. But the effect on modern times has been to stifle creativity and innovation rather than promote it, as many IP proponents would argue. A 2009 study published in the Columbia Science and Technology Law Review found that the patent and copyright system is hurting innovation and wealth creation. In their words, if it turns out that our laws are based upon misinformation and bad assumptions, society may be failing to promote beneficial new technologies that could improve potential quality of life. A 2007 estimate of the cost of the U.S. patent system per year is around $31 billion in patent applications, fees, and litigation, with no discernible point where patent holders break even. A 2008 study shows that the direct comparison of estimated net incentives suggests that for public firms in most industries today, patents may actually discourage investment in innovation. A mid-2000 study examining the world's fairs during the 19th century showed no discernible increase in rates and innovation for countries with or without intellectual property laws. And that's not even half of it. There is a large body of work on the question of intellectual property laws and rates of innovation, and the conclusions consistently ranging between no net benefit to an active detriment. And believe me, I'm just scratching the surface. So the claim that utilitarians and other proponents of idea monopolization make that IP encourages innovation is simply not true. But even if it were true, this wouldn't make it just. The purpose of law ought to be to provide justice, not increase wealth. The utilitarian principle that A benefits more than B is harmed can also be used to justify rape, theft, or murder, so long as the criminal's benefit outweighs the harm. In this sense, utilitarianism is no principle at all, at least not a consistent one, and certainly not an ethical one. You don't need me to explain the effects of IP laws. YouTube is beset by copyright claims on videos, and algorithms take down videos before they're even uploaded. I, personally, made a video for Star Wars Day about how the Galactic Empire was screwed economically, and it got taken down before I even had the chance to make the video public. While the video is up now, and you should watch it, the fact is that thanks to the state, a third party was able to insert itself between my content and your viewing. Another excellent example is one my friend Esoteric the Free had personally experienced with his own personal project. Why don't you tell us more? Hey everyone. Yeah, so I would have contributed quite a bit more to this video, but I already created a video on intellectual property, which is still up on my current channel, but doesn't have many views because, well, it's a re-upload from my first channel, and most people saw it before my first channel was BTFO'd by YouTube for criticizing David Hogg, plus Filthy didn't make any points I wouldn't have. 
Anyway, so back about 10 years ago now, there was an MMO game launch titled Windslayer. It was one of those weeb art style platforming MMOs which was created to compete with the game MapleStory during its heyday. You can still find some footage of it on YouTube from back when it was online. For the most part, the videos are a bunch of grainy 240p quality hypercam rips since this was back before streaming encoders were really developed and there weren't any decent quality desktop recording softwares, and there really isn't that much info or footage of the game which still exists today. Steam existed, but wasn't very mainstream, and definitely wasn't at the point it is now, where just about anyone can publish a game on Steam and have it featured on the front page for millions of people to see. YouTube gaming was in its Let's Play phase, and naturally, since streaming and coders weren't as developed and popular, live streaming platforms had virtually no influence. And since this game was designed to be very community based, having a relatively small publisher which paid no attention to the game, adding virtually no content updates during the game's entire run, and a market where a competitive scene was non-existent, it was doomed for failure and the game's servers were shut down unfortunately. In in August of 2011, despite the relatively niche but dedicated following the game had and has. The story is really tragic because this game was shut down right about the time where Steam started gaining in popularity as a gaming platform, and only two months after Twitch.tv was founded. There was a short-lived attempt to revive the game under the title Windslayer 2 in November of 2011 by the original developers with a different publisher, Ignited Games, which put more emphasis on dungeon crawling, updated the sprites, and added more content within just the couple weeks that it was online, but it didn't even last a month because Ignited was an even shittier publisher than their first and simply just discontinued the game in late December 2011 without even notifying the developers. By chance, I happened to find this game with a group of friends I went to school with back around May of 2009 when we were looking through some of those old MMO review sites like MMO Bomb, and we played quite a bit. The game had easily some of the smoothest controls I've ever experienced, and hands down the best PvP feature of any MMO. It was so good, in fact, that most of the community didn't even level their characters, they just PvP'd all day. If I were to best describe the gameplay, imagine MapleStory with characters which controlled as smoothly as the characters in Brawlhalla or Super Smash Bros., which move as freely and feel about as heavy as the characters in Warframe, with a combat system which was so lacking in grind that the game almost doesn't even feel like it has a leveling system. So, for a while after the game shut down, roughly six years, there was absolutely no activity from the community which existed other than some vague mentions on some fan pages created on Facebook or forum websites of potentially creating a private server or trying to contact Hamelin to secure the game's copyright for themselves. Most of these groups and blogs stopped posting around 2013 to 2015, and the only activity surrounding the game quickly became YouTube comments underneath old uploads from former players lamenting about how much they missed playing the game. Which I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty depressing to read some of those. During these years, I was mainly focused on other interests, but every once in a while I'd look up some old videos on YouTube of the game, or look for any updates. Reading some of those comments under those videos, just sort of watching from a distance, not really taking a strong interest either way, hoping that someone would come along and create a reboot, or that the original devs would eventually decide to launch the game again and publish it through Steam. This, of course, never happened. Now, I can't recall exactly what it was which created my newfound motivation, but in mid-October of 2017, I decided I was going to do something about this because it was clear that the communities which existed around the game had all but disbanded or lost interest, and the developers obviously had no interest in bringing the game back online. Meanwhile, the MMO market is basically dead, with every game being pay-to-win trash or an identical clone of another more successful game.
game, if not clones, then following an obnoxiously similar design philosophy and genre. And a game like Windslayer would kill on the current market given the conditions the market is in, along with the way services and platforms have changed around it since it went offline. Now, I first started to look for the original developers because I assumed that they owned the copyright to the game and figured that since they weren't doing anything with the game, they didn't have any plans to, and that I could probably buy the game from them for a few hundred dollars, if that, and then get together a team to bring the game back online. So I spent a few days simply trying to figure out who worked on the game, given that the company who developed it is incredibly elusive and has little to no information about them published anywhere. But I did eventually manage to find members of the development team and establish contact with them. Now in a perfect world, this would be the end of the complications, but it turns out this was just the tip of the iceberg. I'm not going to identify the people who I spoke with because it could potentially threaten their employment status and position within social circles, so I'm going to refer to them both as Lee and Chung. So when I found the people to contact, I initially got in contact with Lee, and it simply discussed basic information about the community, the state of the MMO market, not anything which I previously didn't touch upon in this video. And eventually I finally managed to ask him about the copyright for Windslayer. So he told me to contact Chung, who was one of the managers of the game's development, and also had a high up position in the company, which genuinely surprised me, as I'm sure it has most of you, given that the studio which developed the game, Hamelin, after Windslayer, went offline and didn't do anything else. So this company has been fully functioning for the last seven years without any actual games or services on the market. I contacted Chung, and this is where shit started to go off the rails pretty quickly. So, when I contacted Chung, I told him that I was interested in possibly buying the copyright for Windslayer, and I quickly learned that Chung was no longer in his position with Hamelin, but that before he left Hamelin, Hamelin actually transferred legal ownership of the copyright for Windslayer to Ignited Games for their deal with Ignited Games to publish Windslayer 2. You know, the aforementioned shady publisher who just dropped all their titles, and whose last post on any of their social media pages was 2014. So I began attempting to look for any information about the people who ran that company, but wasn't able to find anything because unlike Hamelin, Ignited appears to have completely shut down and scrubbed its pathetic existence off the face of the earth. And this is where shit starts getting good. So apparently, Hamelin and former developers who are no longer with Hamelin have been wanting to put Windslayer 2 back online since Ignited pulled the plug back in late 2011, but they haven't been able to create a commercial server because they can't obtain the copyright for the game since the copyright is legally registered to a company which doesn't exist anymore with little to no information about the staff published anywhere. So thanks to a scenario which could easily happen to anyone who produces and or trades any brands, even though there's a relatively decent amount of demand for their own fucking game and has been for years, and the developers have been wanting to put a commercial server back online just as badly as the dedicated following it has wants them to, they can't fucking touch it because the game's brand is legally in a state where it both exists and simultaneously can't be used by anyone solely because of copyright law. Which, by the way, if Filthy or I didn't drive home the point clearly enough already that copyright has absolutely nothing to do with property rights and can't by any means be considered a demonstrable form of property, the fact that quote-unquote intellectual property can exist in a state where it's not owned by anyone, yet can't be used or obtained by anyone, shows that the literal only thing potentially stopping anyone from setting up a commercial server for Windslayer or using any other product or service which exists in this state is the government autistically guarding the brand and not letting anyone use it. It's effectively the same thing as if the government were to just outlaw Windslayer. So it personally irks me now when politicians, media personalities, or shill economists claim that copyright, intellectual property, royal monopoly, 
monopolies or whatever the fuck they want to call them promote creativity and innovation because there are products and services which consumers desperately want and producers desperately want to put out for people to consume but most people don't want to touch them as a result of the risk created by some form of copyright bullshit and that's not even to mention the way in which the government uses the patent office deliberately to stifle innovations which could revolutionize certain industries and drastically improve the quality of life for the general population. Like how it's literally illegal to put out new cures for diseases in the United States. Well, more specifically, it's illegal to sell medicines in the white market without a patent, so trade within venues which are regulated by the state. And you can't get a patent from the FDA for quote-unquote new medicinal compounds. But I digress, because I'm sure you all are wondering how this turned out. Well, this story actually does have a happy ending, which is more than can be said for most others pertaining to copyright bullshit. So fortunately, while the game is offline, clients for the game can still be found archived on file hosting websites across the internet, though it was admittedly a bit difficult to find a complete one. And I managed to come across clients for both Windslayer and Windslayer 2. So the game is obviously in an unplayable state as of right now, given that there's no server online to host it. But, because I have the entire client, this means I'm able to create a non-commercial private server for the game, which is exactly what I've started doing since about early 2018. Progress for the most part has been relatively slow because, well, the communities surrounding the games have been largely disbanded and for the most part I haven't had the resources to actually put together a professional development team. But a month ago, I finally got together enough resources to contract a professional developer, and needless to say that the private server for Windslayer 2 is just about finished. On top of this, I heard from Lee recently that Hamelin managed to find a tiny lead which led them to finding the current copyright holder of Windslayer. Not going to say any more about what Hamelin has planned because it might jeopardize future projects of theirs, but I will say that if any of this game gameplay footage interested you, then the next 12 months are full of things which you can be eagerly looking forward to. And yes, finishing up this private server has largely been the reason why I haven't been uploading as frequently. For anyone who wants a link to the private server's official Discord, then I will post a comment with an invite link under this video. On top of this, as soon as we're done creating this brand new server, and once the private server is online, I'm going to be posting the entire source code onto GitHub to ensure that Windslayer never goes offline again, in case I do get hit with a DMCA, even though OpenSlayer is a private server and therefore falls under fair use, according to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It is very ironic to hear this, especially from defenders of so-called intellectual property, because these people attempt to frame themselves as free marketers, and here they are arguing effectively that they're entitled to have the government violently suppress producers who are doing nothing more than utilizing their resources to try and compete with other producers in the market. It's good to know it's worked out now, but it's heartbreaking to hear about how a project he's been trying to work on for years could be taken down in a single afternoon because of an out-of-date copyright. Another argument presented for intellectual property, along the veins of the encouraging creativity and innovation vein, is that without intellectual property, how would creators earn money for their work if they could just be copied? If we accept that argument as valid, then it must also be true for the copycats. Why would the copycat copy if he himself will also be copied and lose money to the second copycat? Why would the second copycat himself copy if a third copycat would just do the same? Every copycat along that endless line of recursion is also competing with the original creator who holds the original idea. But the same argument could also be applied to all market competition. Honestly, what incentive does Toyota have to produce cars if they'll just lose money to Honda? The answer is the same as with the copycats. Money is made by meeting market demand. You don't need copyright laws to do that. 
Why is it that market competition is the optimal way to produce goods and services for customers except when it comes to the marketplace of ideas? Encouraging creativity my tail. The effect has been an all-out war on creativity that has pitted content creators, especially big companies, against their fans. We also know what happens when you don't have copyright laws in a modern economy. The fashion industry, for example, has a problem with knockoffs, bootlegged reproductions of extremely expensive and high-class clothing that's available for far cheaper. This has actually benefited all parties involved. Consumers get access to high-class clothing at an affordable price. The knockoff producers earn money. But this creates a certain prestige in owning an original design rather than a knockoff, thus allowing high fashion brands to advertise the originality of their designs, while wealthy customers can wear the expensive clothing as a mark of status. Everyone wins in the absence of copyright. Why should entrepreneurs not be allowed to make money? Why should less wealthy people be barred access to affordable clothing? Of course, I'm not even getting to the most horrible abuse in intellectual property, and that is the extent to which the state prevents access to affordable medicine, or even medicine at all, all because of intellectual property. EpiPens are a drug that, when administered, open up the airways of people suffering in anaphylactic shock, in other words, suffocating, due to an allergic reaction. They can be administered by literally anyone, without any medical training, and have saved countless lives from horrifying deaths. In 2007, Mylan, the manufacturer, sold a pack of two for $100. In 2016, the price skyrocketed to $600. All because Mylan has a patent on the formula, which gives them a monopoly on this life-saving drug. In 2015, professional scumbag and winner of the Most Punchable Face of 2015 award, Martin Shkreli, rose the price of Daraprim from $1,350 to $750. He was only able to do this after buying the rights to the patent owned by Daraprim's original manufacturer, and because the U.S. government blocks importing of foreign drugs, which is important because Indian pharmaceuticals sell a generic version of Diaphragm for $0.10, cents, he was able to do this without any market pushback. All because the government protected Shkreli from competitors. Now, a lot of these problems are recognized, but they're misidentified and used as a clarion call in arguments against the free markets that never existed to begin with, to demand more monopolization and centralization that was the problem in the first place. As Jeffrey Tucker points out, what were the medical milestones most significant in history? The list. Penicillin. X-rays. Tissue culture. Anesthetic. Chlorpromazine. Public sanitation. Germ theory. Evidence-based medicine. Vaccines. The pill. Computers. Oral rehydration therapy. DNS structure. Monoclonal antibody technology. And the discovery of the health risks of smoking. Only two of those were patented or were due to some previous patent or brought about with a patent incentive. When you realize there's no good reason for any of this, it's heartbreaking. Intellectual property cannot be property, as it lacks scarcity or exclusivity. The existence of intellectual property is mutually exclusive with property rights, as there is no justification for its existence. It can only ever come about through a coercive monopoly on arbitration, otherwise known as the state. Nor is it true that intellectual property increases wealth or innovation. That's just a form of the special pleading fallacy, and even if it were true, which it isn't, still wouldn't justify anything. As the purpose of law isn't making money, it's justice. But tell me, how is this justice? Or this? Or this? The only people this benefits are the state and their politically connected cronies. People who exclaim that ideas need to be monopolized are either ignorant or they're lying to you. We need a new term for intellectual property, since the phrase gives it an air of authority, while also misleading people into believing that ideas are just another form of property, which it demonstrably isn't. From now on, we shall call it idea monopolization. 
this more accurately identifies the concept for what it really is. The attempt by the state to police your thoughts. Ideas are not property. Period. Questions, comments, critique? What do you think about the term idea monopolization? What are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.